everybody i'm cat and today i have for you as you might already know a true crime case i will also be doing my makeup at the same time and a word in romanian so the word for today is janta 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 well done guys you just said duffel bag on March the 5th, 1951, the decomposed body of a young boy, approximately 5 years old, was found stuffed in a blue denim army duffel bag near Oilville, Virginia, around 26 miles west of Richmond. Sadly, he was never identified and his cause of death has never been released to the public. <laughs> What's astonishing is he was never reported missing and his body was never claimed. To this day, his identity and death are unknown. And yeah, is this the end of the video? Well, it might seem like that, but no, it's not. On that morning in March 1951, Virginia Highway employees were cleaning litter from ditches along State Route 670 which runs south from State Route 250 near Oilville to Cruiser. It was around 8.30 a.m. when Richard Salmon, an employee, discovered something about 15 feet from the road in some young pine trees. A blue army-style sack with what seemed to be the head of a young boy sticking out from it. Shocked at what he found, Richard called his supervisor, who then called Goochland Sheriff Joel Powers. The sheriff and state trooper E.M. Lloyd went to the location and started an investigation with Commonwealth attorney J.C. Nib. After investigating, they concluded that the boy was dead for around a week and may have been in the bag by the road for two or three days. Even though the body showed no sign of trauma, they believed he was killed somewhere else and then dumped in that area. At the scene, they also found a woman's raincoat which was inside the bag with the body of the boy. The boy was described as being between 4 and 6 years old with reddish blonde hair and a fair complexion, 3 feet 5 inches tall with an approximate weight between 50 to 55 pounds. He was found wearing tan dungaree trousers, a tan and blue pullover shirt, a red plaid sweater jacket with a label reading checkers size 4 JC Penny Company. He also had tan socks with blue and pink stripes but he had no shoes. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Jeffrey T. Mann examined the body and found no signs of violence other than two head cuts and some bruising which he determined to be post-mortem. He did mention that because of the state of decomposition it would be at least two weeks before a cause of death could be determined if at all. Sheriff Powers believed that the boy could have been blindfolded when he was placed in the bag because there was a cloth pad over one eye and the second similar pad was found inside the bag. The medical examiner, however, speculated that this could have been a bandage for a cut. Law enforcement and the medical examiner's office were just stumped. There were no missing children reported in and around Goochland and Richmond police stated that no one matching the boy's description was reported in the Richmond area. The only clue they had was a stenciled R9700 laundry mark on the duffel army bag. It could have been an army issue or a manufacturer's tag, but no one knew for sure. This boy's case was actually quite similar to other missing children, especially the 1957 Pennsylvania case in which the boy in the box was found similar to the boy found in the duffel bag. Just like the Virginia victim, the Philadelphia victim was around 4 to 6 years old, similar height and weight. He had short brown hair that was chopped off and had several small scars over his body. He was wrapped in a blanket before being placed inside the box and just like the boy in the bag, his head 
was sticking out of the box. He was also estimated to have only been deceased a few days when he was found. In both of the cases, there was just too much focus on things that appeared to be insignificant. The Philadelphia boy was severely beaten, but when he was found, his fingernails were recently trimmed. The boy in the bag showed no trauma, but but he had a new button stitched on his jacket. A man's handkerchief with the initial G was found near the box in Philadelphia and the woman's grey raincoat was found in the bag with the other boy. The FBI reported that the raincoat was medium in size and would fit a woman 5 feet 6 inches tall weighing between 125 and 135 pounds. Both victims had injuries which were determined to be inflicted after they died. But there were also a lot of things different. The Philadelphia boy was found naked, covered with bruises, with the cause of that described as blunt force trauma. The boy in the bag, on the other hand, was fully clothed and the cause of that, while it was never publicly, publicly released, was determined not to have been violent. But as I covered the case of the boy in the box, thanks to DNA, law enforcement officers and genealogical experts now know who the boy is, Joseph Augustus Zarelli of West Philadelphia. The Virginia Medical Examiner's Office from 1951 was considered at the time to be one of the most technologically advanced and efficient in the nation. And so, by March the 9th, Virginia examiners, with very little assistance from the FBI, were able to reconstruct 10 fingerprints and footprints from the body of the boy in the bag, considered good enough to establish a classification pattern, essentially to try and find links with other cases. There was speculation that the boy in the bag was Danny Watson, who went missing in Quincy, Massachusetts, but this was quickly dismissed because Quincy Police Chief William Ferrazzi said that the boy's description, including height and weight, didn't match. But even so, the fingerprints taken from the boy in the bag were sent to the FBI headquarters for analysis to rule out the other boy, which they did. They ruled it out. Even worse, the prints didn't match anyone on file at FBI. Fingerprint reconstruction was actually a brand new technology in uh, 1951 and it was considered a major achievement, but sadly it didn't help at all with the boy in the back case. Dr. Mann, the medical examiner, said that a cut on the boy's head was made after he died and it seemed more likely at that point that the boy died of natural causes, asphyxiation or exposure. But no one was sure of anything really. They searched through missing persons files in various states but nothing turned up matching this boy's description. They had no idea who the boy was. No one came forward. With no idea who this boy was and with no one coming forward, morticians worked with Dr. Mann trying to restore the boy's face in an attempt to work out how he looked when he was alive. The work of restoring the partly decomposed body represented the embalmer's idea of the boy's appearance on the basis of his bone structure and the remaining tissue. With all the advanced technology at the time, a week into the investigation, there was no progress. There was a five-year-old boy called Albert who disappeared the previous February 17 and Joseph Hannigan, his heartbroken father, even drove from Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts to see if the boy in the bag could have been his son but sadly he drove back home upset but still hopeful after seeing that this boy in the bag was not Albert. But at the same time no one was any closer to finding out who the boy in the bag was. After his fingerprints didn't match anything in their files, the FBI actually backed out of the case. According to David Stout, a former New York Times reporter and author of the 2008 book The Boy in the Box, 
the unsolved case of America's unknown child, the boy's parents could have been poor and marginalized, maybe carnival workers or even migrant laborers who traveled the back roads of life literally and figuratively, figuratively and would have left no, no fingerprints or paper trails. On March 14th, Dr. Mann disclosed that an autopsy revealed no signs that the boy was murdered. He also revealed that final results would not be made available so it doesn't in any way affect the investigation. And the cause of that of the boy in the bag was never publicly stated. On March 31st, there was a break in the case. After the Associated Press published a description of the laundry bag and the stencil on it and sent it to state police and newspapers nationwide, a flint Michigan Army veteran named Delbert Ernest Fisher saw the story in the Lansing State Journal newspaper. Recognizing the stencil as the last four digits of his own army serial number, he drove to the journal office and sent a message via shortwave radio to the Richmond police. Although it might have seemed helpful, sadly his bag was stolen from him in a laundromat in 1946 in Amarillo, Texas. So again, this lead went dead as well. By April the 1st, state police investigator Captain R.B. King speculated that the boy was not from Virginia and he could have been kidnapped from out of state. With the possibility that the case was interstate, the FBI jumped back in and provided additional assistance. They highlighted the case in the May 1951 edition of their magazine, Law Enforcement Journal and Appeal for Any Lead. Several more parents of missing children went to Richmond to look at this boy, but all of them turned away being sure that this child was not theirs. Investigators began looking for any clues around the area where the boy was initially found. The bag was found 15 feet from the road beside a home under construction in a group of young pines on an embankment around 200 yards south of Route 250, which was a major east-west road through pre-interstate central Virginia. This location ruled out the possibility that someone threw the bag from a car. They also concluded that the bag could not have been there more than a few hours before it was found as it was highly visible from the road. The ground under the bag was also dry while the surrounding ground was damp. February the 7th 1961, a whole decade after the discovery of the Goochland boy, Brunswick County, Virginia Sheriff W.E. Hill reported that the body of a young girl, around seven or eight years old, was found in the woods just off State Route 1 near Lawrenceville. The girl was wrapped in an old tattered blanket similar to the body of the Philadelphia boy, the boy in the box, and just off the main highway, just as the boy in the bag. The girl's body was examined by Dr. Mann and he concluded that she died from malnutrition, exposure and neglect. The girl as well was dressed in clothing from J.C. Penney, just like the boy in the bag. At the same time, the Philadelphia boy's body was found in a box which held a bassinet also from J.C. Penney. So, you know, it kind of might seem like we are getting a tiny, tiny bit closer. A Brunswick deputy helped a family when their car broke down and he had a tip to pass on. The couple's car broke down near the girl's body's location. This revealed that the parents were Kenneth and Irene Dudley of Paxville, North Carolina. They were itinerant carnival workers who, just as speculated by David Stout in the Boy in the Box case, traveled the back roads of life, crossing the country, looking for work with six of their ten children. The whole family crammed in their broken down 1940 two-door sedan car. But the investigation into the death of their little girl named Carol Ann revealed a horrific story about the Dudley family that may or may not have a link 
to the Goochland boy or the boy in the bag. The Dudleys actually had a lot of children. Their first child, Marjorie, born in 1936, and their third child, Jean, born in 1940, they grew up and they actually left home before their parents became carnival workers. The second child, Edward, who was born in uh, 1937, died mysteriously of unknown causes in November of that year and actually his body was never found. Kenneth Edwin Jr. died as well under mysterious circumstances in 1947 when he was only six years old and he was buried by his father in their backyard because he claimed that they couldn't afford a funeral for the boy. The father later served nine months in Jamesville prison for illegal burial when his son's body was discovered in 1949. Five of the remaining six children, including Charles, Norman, Claude, Debbie Jean and Carol Ann, all died of starvation and neglect on the road and their bodies were dumped at various locations. Two-year-old Christine Adele was alive and with the parents when they were caught. After being caught, Richmond investigators immediately tried to tie the Dudley family to the Zarelli child or the boy in the box, but there is no record if they looked for links to the Goochland boy or the boy in the bag. Kenneth Dudley, who tried to pin the blame for all the deaths of the children on his wife, was actually convicted of manslaughter in the death of Carol Ann and he was sentenced to 20 years in the Virginia State Penitentiary in Richmond. His wife Irene was sentenced to 10 years. It was alleged that Irene was possibly abused by Kenneth and so she wasn't at fault. After serving his sentence, Kenneth was transferred to New York's Auburn prison to start a life sentence for the murder of 18-year-old Mrs. Mary Vela, an acquaintance whom he choked to death in 1949 in an argument over money. The youngest child, Christine, was placed in foster care. Kenneth Dudley died at Auburn in 1984 and Irene died in Syracuse in 2001. There were never any other attempts to link the boy in the bag to the Dudleys. And I just want to say that I will cover the Dudleys case in a separate video because he was just horrific. On April the 3rd, 1951, almost one month after the boy in the bag was found, there was another break in the case. On March 31st, Associated Press story generated eight letters to the Richmond Bureau of Police and inquiries to the Virginia State Police. While most of them were from individuals, two letters about missing children were from police departments in Oakland, California, Muncie, Indiana, and a third was from Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Oakland and Muncie missing children were not matches and they were quickly discounted, but the letter from Grand Rapids police claimed that the operators of a licensed home for children read the news story and reported that the description of the boys in the back body matched the description of a boy who left the home the previous December 1950. The Grand Rapids Police said in the letter that the boy's mother and the possible stepfather took the boy from the boarding house mentioning that they were always arguing and the stepfather didn't really seem to like the boy and didn't really have any use for him. They also said that the mother mentioned that she was from Huntington West Virginia. The boy in question was around five years old. He had reddish blonde hair and he had been at this home for two years. Unfortunately though nothing came from this lead which sounded very promising. Whilst the Philadelphia boy in the box generated massive media coverage, the Goochlands boy life, death and cremation went unnoticed and he was soon forgotten. There were no TV shows made about his life his mysterious death and eventual abandonment. The Virginia State Police even responded to a Freedom of Information Act request stating any records could not be found or do not exist in the department's investigative files. The Richmond City Sheriff's Office has no information either. A Grand Rapids, Michigan Police Department official 
wrote in response to an inquiry for records that they have no records either. The FBI, despite being given all available information in the case in two separate Freedom of Information requests responded that they were unable to identify any records either. An anonymous volunteer investigator for the Doe Network, an organization devoted to assisting investigating agencies in closing cold cases involving missing and unidentified persons, was surprised to find that the boy was not listed in any person's database, including though the Center for Missing and Exploited Children or NAMAS, the National Resource Center for Missing, Unidentified and Unclaimed Persons Cases. Now, at this point in time, there is an entry in both NAMAS and the Doe Network on the Goochland Boy. Also, a Facebook page devoted to this case, but how long did that take? By the end of June 1951, over three months since the boy was found, the case was dead despite State Police Chief R.B. King telling the Richmond Time Dispatch that they are still working on it. The article reported that if the boy was not claimed, within one year the body would be cremated and the ashes would be kept for five years. After five years, the ashes would then be buried in a local cemetery. But his burial spot is unknown. Any connections to the Dudley family are just speculation. It was established that the Dudley family did pass through Virginia on State Route 250 throughout the 50s into the early 60s when Kenneth frequently looked for work at the winter headquarters of Frank Bergen's World of Mirth Carnival, located at the state fairgrounds in Richmond. While the boy's death, the disposal of the body along the road and the style of clothing is consistent with the Dudley parents, there are also differences. The Goochland boy's age doesn't match those of any Dudley children. He was not starved like the other children and there were no signs of mistreatment on his body. Another Doe investigator with 15 years of experience in missing persons said that he was leaning towards the boy's birth, never recorded anywhere. Maybe there were no relatives or neighbors who even knew about him, which would make it that much easier for the parents to dispose of him if no one ever even knew that he existed. With no evidence or records proving that the boy was ever identified or his body claimed, I think we can assume that he was eventually cremated at the Richmond morgue, possibly in late April 1952. According to that brief and the Final Times Dispatch report, his ashes were presumably kept for five years, then buried in an unknown, most likely unmarked location. And I suppose that, you know, if there are no records of anything about this case, even if now with the modern technology the case could be reopened, there really is nothing left to work with. It's so sad because this boy, he will forever be known as the boy in the blue denim duffel bag. It's just heartbreaking because you have a little boy who is found deceased and no one ever came forward with any information on who he might be. I'm also certain that someone knows something though, but they might not even be alive anymore. It's really sad. Thank you guys so much for staying with me. Please do let me know what do you guys think in the comment section down below. For now, take care, stay safe and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!